Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. This is going to be the part two of a general review for peripheral nerve disorders. Again, we're joined by Dr. Rob Spinner from Mayo Clinic. Ron, Rob, thanks again, and please proceed. Sure, thanks, Aaron. I'd like to continue along this review for uh, boards on peripheral nerve subjects that might be of interest. I'd like to now uh, spend the next few minutes talking about nerve entrapments. Uh, all examiners have hands, so I think uh, different hand postures would be something that you might think about. Let's talk about some basic principles of nerve entrapments. Any nerve can be compressed anywhere along its course. Most nerve compressions occur, though, at predictable sites, namely fibro-osseous or fibromuscular tunnels. In other words, tunnel syndromes. In a true sense, entrapments really shouldn't encompass mass lesions because mass lesions could occur anywhere. So for example, a buttock level tumor causing sciatic nerve symptoms really isn't piriformis syndrome, for example. Now the pathophysiology can either be understood in terms of static or dynamic compression. And I think that's important when you think about provocative maneuvers that we've all learned. Now there are some clinical features that should be known and are predictable. I'm simple-minded. I think that nerves do three things. They do pain fibers, there's muscle fibers, and there's sensory fibers. And they can all have associated dysfunction and you need to ask about these when you're taking a history and doing a physical exam. But the key is, is that the pattern of presentation with these syndromes, by definition, is largely predictable. I use this analogy from my friend Michelle Clio, uh, who will be in UCSF. Um, I think that the physical exam, along with the history and testing, are similar to the legs of a table. And the more legs of a table you have, the more stable the table. So in other words, when you're defining any syndrome, it's nice when you have four legs, history, physical exam, EMG, and then imaging. Now, of course, you don't need imaging in all cases, especially with a routine carpal tunnel. But in some of the rare ones, again, three out of four legs is good, two out of three four is okay, but once you're less than two, for example, you're really not on very stable ground. Nerve blocks can also give some information. In my hands, I think nerve blocks are also effective when they don't produce a clinical outcome, because then you know when it produces an effect that it may not be the nerve that's the problem. Now, non-operative measures should always be considered. For your oral boards, most likely the patient won't get better, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but in general, uh, what we should think about with any nerve entrapment, whether it's carpal tunnel or some of the other ones, is a period of rest, avoiding the exacerbating activities or positions, some type of splinting perhaps, physical therapy, non-steroidals, and or corticosteroid injections as a whole. Now again, surgery is often done, especially when you're taking your boards, and in this case, if they're done, the goals would be for a compression syndrome is to eliminate the compression. You want to ensure that there's a good bed for a nerve, let's say like the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, a sensory nerve, you can either do a neurolysis or if it's expendable, some people would do a neurectomy, that's controversial. The basic principles of surgery would be to be done when there are persistent symptoms after a trial of non-operative therapy, a progressive deficit under your watch, or significant atrophy by the time the patient presents to you. In general, these are very gratifying procedures. So typically good to excellent results in primary cases, and good for pain control when you're even doing a revision case under the right circumstances. Let's start with the median nerve. The median nerve is the most commonly entrapped. We all know about carpal tunnel. 